The favourite, uh, Olivia Coleman, came on the programme a couple of weeks ago and was just a supercalifragilistic expialidocious fantabulous guest, yes. wasn't she? Well, yes, and, inc- and people will remember amazingly reticent and embarrassed about being good. Yes, because you were talking about how well the movie's been received and all the kind of accolades that she's getting for it, and she went, yeah, yeah, it's silly. Anyway, so, a new film by uh, Yorgos Lanthimos, a uh, Greek director. I know you're a big fan of uh, Dogtooth and uh, you rushed out to see The Lobster. And you're Didn't see it. Big, big Yorgos back catalogue. So, anyway, set in uh, 18th century England in the court of Queen Anne, uh, last of the Stuarts, but about whom very, very little is... Sp- I mean, I know the stuff is known, but as you said to Olivia Coleman, what did you know about beforehand? Answer, nothing. You asked me, answer, nothing. Then you said to Olivia Coleman, what research did you do? She said, nothing. I did what was on the page. So... Um, uh, this is uh, written by, original script by Deborah Davis and then Tony McMara. Deborah Davis's original script dates back to the late 90s, at which point I think the film, it was originally called The Balance of Power. So Queen Anne is basically um, depressed, uh, riddled with gout, plagued by suicidal thoughts. She's an unconfident ruler and she relies very heavily upon the advice of uh, Lady Sarah Churchill, played by Rachel Weiss, um, who is her confidant, her informer, and also her lover. And basically, she has effectively handed over the reins of power to Lady Sarah. Uh, at the very beginning of the film, we discover that there's a, a, the, the war has been going on with France, and uh, this is costing a lot of money. And Lady Sarah's husband, played by Mark Gatiss, Lord Marlborough, is uh, involved in the war in which he is sort of rather victorious. But the opposition have said, enough, enough with the war, enough, we, we won't stop, we want a truce with the French, we want all, 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 that stuff to, all that stuff to finish. But what's very clear is that Sarah has the Queen's ear. She is the person who is able to say to the Queen the things that nobody else will say. She is the person who, in her own mind, loves her more than anybody else and is therefore more honest with her than anybody else. I'm ready for the Russian ambassador. Who did your makeup? We went for something dramatic. Do you like it? You look like a badger. Oh. Are you going to cry? Really? Well, what do you think you look like? Badger. Do you really think you can meet the Russian delegation looking like that? No. I will manage it. Go back to your rooms. Thank you. Did you just look at me? Did you? Look at me! Look at me! How dare you! Close your eyes! Shouting at a page boy happens to be standing in the corridor as she walks past. Anyway, into this very sort of hermetically sealed world comes uh, Abigail, who has fallen upon hard times uh, and is a cousin of Sarah's. She said, I, you know, cousin Sarah, I, please give me a job. So she says, okay, fine, takes pity on her, misjudges her, sends her to the scullery. But the very next thing, she's managed to worm her way into the Queen's affections, into the Queen's bedchamber, and she has basically become a rival for the favourite. So the thing is, therefore, about it's a it's a three-way power struggle between these three characters, all, all of whom are intimately involved. And what happens within their intimate relationship has repercussions around the world. You know, will the war in France carry on? Will it not carry on? What's going to happen with the politics? But the whole point about it is it's very hermetically sealed in this strange world of the court of Queen Anne in which everything is a little out of kilter. And one of the ways that that out of kilterness is demonstrated is through Robbie Ryan's cinematography, which used these very, very wide angle lenses that kind of bend the world into an almost a spherical shape. So as the camera is whipping around the corridors and the bedrooms, the edges of it are sort of curved and bent in a slight... Fish eye? No, it's not a fish eye. Fish eye is like lots of different ones, isn't it? But it's... It's just, it's just a bit... A bit I thought it looked like a fish eye. OK, we'll say fish eye in that case. No. <laughs> and so you get this this sense of, ev- of the vast space being contracted. You, well, I think there's also a sort of Alice in Wonderland feel because one of the things is that the Queen has these bunnies, these rabbits that she refers to as the little ones, that she refers to as the children. And so she's playing in her in her quarters with these rabbits and she gets everybody to say hello to the rabbits. So the whole thing has this slightly dreamy, slightly nightmarish, slightly out of kilter uh, um, sort of uh, tenor to it. And on the one hand, it's very arch and very funny and it reminded me to some extent of... Um, uh, Whit Stillman's uh, Jane Austen adaptation, Love and Friendship, in which it's very clipped, very crisp, people saying things to each other that are you know, searing and scabrous, but very f- funny, but also sort of quite bitter and sharp. 
But the reason it works, and I think one of the reasons that it's that it's striking a, a chord, is that there is something else going on there, which is something else which is which is more serious. So on the one hand, at times it made me think of the draftsman's contract meets Bound, and you know it's all sort of you know wonderfully dressed with fantastic costumes. But there is this sense of tragedy behind uh, the character of Queen Anne that you you discover is to do partly with the fact that she has uh, she has had she is grieving for these for the for lost children for whom the rabbits have become a substitute, and so at the centre of it is this and it's a, it's a definitely a, you know it's three central players but at the centre of that is Olivia Coleman with her portrayal of I'm I'm correcting myself because when you said you're the star of the film she said I'm the co-star of the film along with mm -hmm. Emma Stone and Rachel Weisz which is which is quite correct. Um, at the centre of it you have this performance which on the one hand is childish. On the other hand, has a kind of queeny uh, imperiousness, to use the word that you used in that interview, which I'm now going to be using for the rest of the day because I, I hadn't heard it for a while. Imperious. And I'm, I'm imperious, that's a lovely word. Talking about poppins rather than... Yeah, no, 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 I know, but, yeah, but it's a, that's why I said in the okay. interview that you did before. Um, but also this real sense of pathos and tragedy and, and pain. And because you have that, it's like... Um, you know, it's like the salt or the spice in a meal. It's the thing that cuts through that... It, it's the thing that makes all of this actually work because it's so it's not just basically people uh, firing off each other and being snippy with, you know, very, very funny dialogue and, you know, strange off kilter camera angles. So the camera is always looking from really, really weird places. You tend to think of period dramas as being very sort of, you know, uh, state uh, stately and, you know, everything sort of lined up very nicely. You know, look at the frocks, you know, look at the corridors, look at the palace. This, the camera is, it's down at floor level, it's up at the aisle of it's, you know, it's whipping backwards and forwards. It's deliberately doing that thing about sort of constantly disorientating you. And... I think what you get, therefore, is on the one hand, it is really funny. I mean, I did laugh a lot and I've seen it twice now and I did laugh a lot. But there is something more to it, which is that it does have that sense of heft because it has a sense of tragedy behind it. And there is that the power play, which is at the centre of it, is... You, I thought worked really well because you're never quite sure of anybody's motives. You're never quite sure who actually loves who or who is just playing who. Um, I like the fact that the men are preposterously bewigged and painted and, you know, wearing this ludicrous, making these ridiculous heels and these stupid costumes. And they're actually com just completely peripheral. What they do really doesn't make any difference. They're all just sort of gallivanting around being fops. And at the centre of it are these three men, each, each one of whom in their own way is strong, but in very, very different ways. And But I do think that right at the heart of it, the kind of lightning rod that makes the thing work is Olivia Coleman's performance. Uh, I, I also thought that the, the use of the music was was very, very interesting in the way in which on the one hand you had that kind of, you know, the Handel and Purcell, and then you had this like experimental scrapey violin. I told you about that. Yeah, I know which you said once you start here, but I thought it was actually rather well used. I thought that worked. And then of course it ends up with Elton John playing the harpsichord. Yeah, but I can't get over the... <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Forever. But if the point is that when that first comes in, it's when she burns her hand in the lime and the queen is suffering from gout and it's the build-up of pain that is then relieved by the release of pain. Yeah, but why do I have to suffer? Just because they're uh, be, suffering. Be, because that's what the film's about. It's about... It's yeah. got, that's, what, that's what I mean about it's the salt in the wound. It's the, it's the spice in the dish. It's the... It's the I'm, I'm out of clichés. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I enjoyed it very, very much. I thought, it, I thought the performances were terrific and I thought it was very interesting to see essentially the idea of a period costume drama just thrown out the window and said, actually, this, this is happening in a historical time, but it's not about that historical time. It feels, it cr feels cruelly contemporary.